Good evening. Welcome to Mr. Snacks, Soul, Cafe. My name is Alexandra, and tonight's subject is titled, Illusions of Life, Part 2. Here's Hiroshi. Thank you, Alexandra. Welcome. Part 2, Illusions of Life. You know, uh, as the sages have shared, the world is Maya, or illusion. Illusion doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does. But not as the mind thinks it does. The Illusions of Life. Today we'll deal with the illusion of the music industry, Part 1. And... Um, as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, that slavery is still going on today. The slave owners of yesterday, the plantation owners, have transformed into the corporations today. And we're going to look into the music industry, the industry I've been involved in since, uh, since the Middle Ages. <laughs> uh, Anyway, many, many artists in the past, such as the late Prince and Michael Jackson, uh, many others, complained about being screwed by the labels. Uh, one New York Times headline dated, here it is right here, September 6, 2001, was music stars complain about stringent contracts. Name that pops up, Lou Perelman, the music manager of the Backstreet Boys. Remember them? And in sync. Uh, the story was covered on a Netflix titled Boy Band Con. One of the stories was um, in that series was a, uh, a dinner that Lou had with members of the group in sync during a time when NSYNC was selling millions of albums. They were huge. And having just completed a world, world tour, and at the end of the tour, um, met with them and he handed them checks to each member, check for $10,000. This is the band that made multi-millions of dollars. So where did the rest of the money go? Of course. Lou Perriman's pocket, not in sync. Later on, they spent a lot of time and money trying to get out of their contract with Perriman, the slave owner. But in all fairness, um, in sync and Backstreet Boys probably wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for Lou, right? And his money and his backing and his gamble. So let's go back to the year 1999. Sean Fanning teamed up with Sean Parker, his two young cats, created Napster. I don't know if you remember that. Napster was a software that allowed users all around the world to share music files. This whole thing just took off, and the software accumulated over 25 million users, at least. This was all about free music and the buying of albums and music was coming to a close and the labels were freaking out a little bit they were in trouble let's get into some figures here you know at that time the record companies this is before napster had an 85 percent 15 percent split with the artists so for every record sold, the label's cut was 85%, and the artist took 15%. So the labels were making billions based on sales at that time, before Napster. The three major companies were Universal, Sony Music, and Warner Music Group. Yeah, so the artists were making money from the tours and merchandising, and the labels, well... They already had their cut of 85% right off the top. So when music was available for free, the labels needed to make their money, you know? So then the labels came up with what? The 360 contract, which was a contract where the labels, or I should say slave owners, but you know, wanted to make a cut on everything. Well, they want their money. And 
and um, they wanted to make a cut on everything the artists did. So they had their cut on touring, merchandising, publishing, and even the personal income, you know, of the artists. So this is how it works. So you're a new artist, and the label will give what they call an advance to an artist. New artist comes in needing money, right? It's about the money. This money is given so the artist can pay all the personal expenses while making the album. Personal expenses like paying their rent, car payments, their bills, food, and all that. So this was given so the artist can focus on doing the album and not worry about the bills. Right. So the label comes in and say they will invest $500,000 to up to $2 million, even before the artist makes any money for the label. And these expenses by the label are called recoupable expenses. So it's not really an investment because the artist actually owes this money for the most part back to the label. So the illusion is you see the artist wearing the bling and driving the expensive cars. You see this in videos advertising and renting nice homes wearing expensive designer clothes that money has to be paid back it's not just given to them <laughs> so that's the illusion we think they own all that stuff what you see in those videos gives the public the impression the artist owns all that no lies 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 selling a lie and an image the record companies get their money first off the top. They don't lose. Then the rest goes out. So if I, let's say, 100,000 albums, I sell 100,000 albums at, what, um, $10 a pop. The total revenue is $1 million. Record company gets their $850,000 off the top. And the artist gets the 150000 So the recoupable was $500,000, right? So you're in debt <laughs> for $350,000, right? Because you had that advance. So you'll tour, but recall the 360 deal. The label has their hands in every area now because the music's free for the most part. Now here's an example of the 360 deal. 50% of the merchandise goes to the label. They get their 25% from the touring, live performances, 25%, uh, some of the publishing, endorsements, TV appearances, movies, book publishing, sheet music, whatever. And don't forget the 25% from ringtones and sales from the artist site. Keep in mind, you know, you have other people to pay too. The artist has, what, an accountant? Or accountant agency, right? Accounting agency. Lawyers, promoters. And that's on the artists, not on the labels. They get their money off the top. And you have to deal with the rest as an artist. So um, on with uh, some examples. You know, TLC, remember them? The girl group? They filed for bankruptcy in the 90s. And they sold millions. I remember checking out their music, number one here and there. Um, and they toured. And I actually saw the Grammy show where they held up four or five Grammys saying over the mic that they were broke. Terrible PR, right? So um, Ice Cube left NWA because he was, wasn't making any money in the group, even though they were selling in their, their shows. Tony Braxton filed for bankruptcy and having to pose for Playboy to pay her bills. And the list goes on. Prince compares record contracts to slavery in an interview with the media. 
So there you go, the slavery continues, right? Another thing is the label owns the masters. This is your work as an artist. Unless you work out a deal with the labels to buy the masters so you can own what is yours. Taylor Swift, I mean, Prince, Michael Jackson, and many others fought to own the masters. Right? So they had to work out a deal with the record companies. So um, on with the streaming services. The record companies have deals with the streaming where they get their cut as well. They're involved in everything. If you're an artist, for example, on Spotify, I have some figures for you, you will need 34,000 album streams every month to make $1,500 every month. So the labels are in it to make money with no guarantees, right? So they're taking the burden. Um, no guarantees that the artists they sign will make it big. So that's why they have the 360 deals. And the larger artists, the superstars they have, will make up plenty for the smaller artists on the label that um, may not succeed. And, you know, the, the person who wasn't a superstar needs the label for the most part, right? Because they started from zero. So it takes millions sometimes to make an artist a star and money to keep them there. And keep in mind, the money is recoupable from the artist. So yes, the artist may feel like a slave, but the label see it as an opportunity for the many artists out there that want to be a star. The real money is running the labels and owning the music. You know, that is why so many artists see the importance of owning the masters. So this is what they mean by signing a deal with the devil. The devil meaning the record company. Little Richard once said to James Brown in the early years, when you see the devil, he won't be hot red and have no fiery tail. He'll be white and wearing a fancy suit. And let me add, okay, be fair, the devil can be black just as well. Maybe some of you are too uh, young to, to know the tune. In the still of the night, that sold around 13 million copies, would have been worth six figures in royalties. Instead, the writer, and the performer, Fred Paris, he made $783 from that. Got screwed, of course. The single, you remember the single, I Can't Go For That, No Can Do, was a hit single by Hall & Oates, was written because of a disagreement with their record company. Don't you love these stories? I mean, my goodness. Little Richard, remember Tutti Frutti? a tune that just pretty much shaped rock and roll. You know, you think he cashed in on, on that tune? You know, especially records, you know. Uh, what was it, his name? Art Rupe, Roop or whatever, bought the song, rights and all. So he owned the song, gave Little Richard, what, 50 bucks. And he was generous, a half a cent for each record that was sold. But they settled out of court. Well, sorry for all the gloom, but uh, we will continue. We're coming to a close now. Continue with more illusions of the music industry in our next segment. Thanks for joining us. Take care. <laughs> 